Hi, welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 21, the last episode. Okay, and we're, we're recording on September 19th, 2017. This wasn't supposed to be the last episode, um, but I just like, you know, I spoke to my doctor, and, uh, you know, the result of a test came back, and although I'm not necessarily dying anytime soon, um, something relatively serious has, has, you know, I need to address. So I figured, you know, I need to like de-stress and kind of like do less, just pay more attention to that. Um, I was, you know, like the show was getting difficult, I mean, just recently because we were dealing with some difficult topics. Um, a couple of shows ago, it was about climate change. Last show was about animal cruelty. And today's show was supposed to be about abortion. I mean, I don't, necess- I don't really like to do these kinds of shows because, you know, from my perspective, you know, we humans don't have a free will. Nothing's actually up to us. Nothing's actually up to anything. It's all cause and effect. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we, we, we are sometimes destined or fate- fated to do very good things, and sometimes we're fated to do very not so good things. And, you know, we tend to get rewarded or punishment, repunished both as individuals and as, as a global society, I believe, for, for what we do. So um, let me just, you know, briefly get into the abortion thing a bit. And then, then I'm just going to talk extemporaneously about, you know, kind of like summarizing the show, what this was about, what, you know. So the, the, the thing with the abortion is um, the older I've, I've gotten, even though I've been a, a liberal, you know, pretty much my entire life, um, you know, the, um, abortion to me seems more and more wrong. Um, basically, you know, on our planet, there are about 50 to 60 million people who die every year. And um, global poverty accounts for a lot of that, you know. <clears throat> and um, then, you know, just other th- things. But, but what's, you know, what's really, you know, somewhat unconscionable is like about... A similar number of people, you know, die every year from abortion, unborn people. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult kind of situation for humanity because I, I think a lot of times we, we don't really hear about how the problem developed. I mean, like for thousands, tens of thousands of years, um, hundreds of thousands, you know, our species and the species that we evolved from were biologically designed to reach a level, level of puberty at around 12, 13, 14, 15, and then begin to raise families. You know, um, that was the natural order. You know, women get pregnant at that time, and that's the way it was done. Um, so the problem that we've um, faced over the last, especially 100 years, is that we have been delaying this, you know, cultural time of, of starting a family more and more. So, like, you know, uh, for many people, it, it was delayed into the 20s, and now it's being delayed into the 30s, you know. Um, and, and so, like, the problem this creates is, again, like, you know, we're, we're biological beings designed hor- hormonally and in various ways to want to mate, to want to procreate. It's a very strong drive, this sex drive. And to the extent that we've created a civilization or the civilization has evolved that thwarts this very basic biological drive, you know, to a great extent, we, um, we, we fail at it. You know, we just, you know, and I think that's just one part of it. There are other parts of this, for example, um, when abortion was illegal, and, you know, I'm not going to say what the answer is, you know, whether it should be made illegal or not, um, but when it was illegal, you know, abortion wasn't a very safe and um, easy thing to do, you know. I mean, imagine abortion without the, the medical procedures. You know, medicine makes it very kind of like antiseptic, um, you know, just very um, medicinal. It's just like, you know, it's just like a medical procedure, whereas like, you know, what actually happens is a bit, um, you know, it's, it's like the same thing with, with animals and veganism. You know, if people, if we had to slaughter 
our own animals, you know, to kill them and stuff to eat them, there'd probably be a lot more vegans on the planet. And so, like, you know, with abortion, if people had to abort their own kill, uh, children, you know, it'd probably be different. So, you know, basically, I think, you know, just one last thought about this. Um, I think liberals, the Democrats, have taken the wrong approach. I, I think, you know, like everybody agrees that it's wrong. You know, Bill Clinton, um, no, nobody defends, you know, that says, oh yeah, abortion's right. Um, but I think the, the approach should have been that um, instead of perhaps making it legal or making it so widespread, um, what should have happened, and maybe what should happen, is like to create a world where, see, a lot of times women, you know, I would imagine some some abortions happen because, you know, the we, we, we don't perhaps value life as, as much as we should. You know, some women just don't want to be inconvenienced. Like, let's say they have career plans or just, you know, <clears throat> so like some of that is, accounts for that. I think other uh, abortions, are, are much more serious in the sense that they, they come from a woman, you know, very genuinely fearing for the welfare of her, her children. If, if a woman's like in, in poverty or in circumstances that are, you know, that she believes that the child would just like have a very miserable life, that probably, you know, explains a good number of the abortions. So, so basically, you know, the answer may really not be to, to continue to make it as, as, you know, to promote it and, uh, you know, to make it as, as accessible as it is. Again, I'm not going to go into the legality of it, but, um, but to, to create conditions so a woman doesn't have to fear that. Um, yeah, it is, it is difficult. So in other words, like, any time a woman gets pregnant, um, she would be guaranteed, completely assured that that child would be provided for. Again, some people may not agree with this because then they might say, well, a woman would just get pregnant, uh, you know, just whatever. But, but, you know, I think that is a better approach. And relative, you know, we've been talking about, like, you know, how we treat animals, how we treat the poor, how we treat the planet, how we're collectively, you know, both rewarded and punished for what we do. And, you know, I have a feeling that um, this, again, 56 to 60 million abortions every year, about as many people as die from every other cause combined. You know, to the extent there's like a... Um, kind of a divine or spiritual or natural kind of judgment, you know, to reality, to life. You know, it seems that we may be um, being judged in this way. All right, so enlightenment. Um, I guess what we've been talking about just now with the abortion issue and, you know, global poverty and veganism and all that stuff, uh, animal cruelty, is, is the evolution of our species, because we are evolving, we're getting a lot more intelligent. You know, I think every every um, decade, I don't know, IQ keeps on going up. You know, the, the young kids are getting smarter and smarter. Uh, people are getting healthier. We're just like, you know, we're evolving as a species. You know, and a lot of it has to do with with being able to live longer, acquire more information that we then. Um, basically transfer to our progeny, to our kids, and then they, you know, start um, at, a, at a higher plane in a sense. So, um, so there is this collective kind of evolution um, toward greater and greater enlightenment that's happening. This show has been more about the individual enlightenment. You know, we go through life and, you know, we basically describe enlightenment as... <coughs> um, Having three main components, you know, to, to kind of like to recognize, to understand that happiness is our um, why we're here. It's, it's our fundamental goal. And sometimes we take altruistic paths where we sometimes like make sacrifices for the good, good of others or society and stuff. But even that is, is you know, generally to, to basically to to fulfill the, our, 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 what our conscience demands. Um, other, let's see. Um, okay, I lost my train of thought. So, all right, so, oh yeah, so happiness is, is, is certainly, you know, key in terms of enlightenment. And to the extent, I mean, like here in the United States, 
uh, the average level of happiness is about 70%. Um, and you know, even among the happiest people, about 20% of the population is either 80% happy or happier. But you know, what's telling about this is that even among the, ha the happiest people among us, they're only happy about 54% of each day. Um, there's a, about 30% where they're neither happy nor unhappy. No, no, where they're, where they're unhappy, and another 20% where they're neither happy nor unhappy. But like you know, going through life being happy only 54% or, or uh, t of each day, that doesn't seem like what we should be aspiring for. So like happiness, uh, enlightenment to a great extent is about understanding that you know happiness is what why we do whatever we do i mean think about everything it's, it's why we um work at what we work it's why we, we we have friends why we get married why we raise families anything we do and aristotle said this you know aristotle kind of like understood that that happiness is the only end in life everything else is a means you know we don't do anything you know sometimes we make mistakes we, we sometimes think that something's going to make us happier when it actually doesn't but our intention is always to become happier. So, like, so basically, enlightenment is first and foremost about happiness. But you know, there is this morality component. Now, there is certainly a happiness that comes at the expense of others. Is not um, enlightened. It's it's not good. It's it's it's, it's immoral. Sometimes you know we 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 choose to not look around us and see you know what what who needs help, you know, how we can be of help to others, or sometimes we, we become greedy. We, we just want more and more and more, uh, regardless of, of people having not enough. Um, so, so basically, the, another part of, you know, enlightenment, you know, and it, and it applies to our treatment of animals, to the treatment of the poor, to, the, to our guardianship of the, of the planet, of the climate, is about doing the right thing, understanding right from wrong, and, and you know, working to, to become better and better at doing good. And, and the last part of, of enlightenment, I think there's three basic components. It could be broken down into some details and all, but um, it's the idea of, of getting reality right. Um, you know, for example, many, you know, we, we used to think that, that the world was flat, okay? And it made sense to us, you know, like from, you know, before we understood the basic, you know, geometry of, well, before we could calculate, <laughs> before we could understand why it's not flat, it made sense to believe. Um, and we used to think the sun revolved around us, okay, instead of we revolving around the sun. Now, these are not, but a lot of these kinds of, like, mistaken perceptions of reality don't really matter. I mean, like, you know, somebody could, like, believe the earth is flat. Actually, Orthodox Jews still believe the, the sun revolves around the earth. Um, but, you know, see, the thing is that those kind of beliefs don't really affect much. You know, they're kind of inconsequential to our day-to-day -day reality and existence. But there are some, some um, beliefs that are hugely counterproductive to our well-being, both as individuals and as a global society. And the one that I, you know, I... I did a 216 episode series on this um, here in the station. The, 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 the truth that we don't have a free will, that actually nothing is up to us. So it's just like mistaken and morally wrong for us to blame ourselves or anyone else for anything. And if you can, if you can kind of like envision the kind of world that um, will hopefully eventually come about when people understand this and appreciate its significance, then it'd be a world without blame. A world would be so much more harmonious, compassionate, you know, filled with understanding. You, you know, it's like nobody would have a rational reason to become angry, for example, with anyone or with oneself about anything. So like this, this, you know, this truth that we don't have a free will is, is very important. And naturally, you know, it leads to some somewhat uncomfortable truths also. In other words, like, if, if we understand that, that nothing that happens is up to any of us, nothing that happens is up to anything. In other words, like particles move through space. It's like cause and effect. You know, that's how our reality works. This is understood in physics. It's understood in biology. Um, then, you know, when we apply this truth of our not having a free will to how things happen or what happens, 
you know, and we, like 80, 90 percent of us here in the United States, believe in God or higher power, which makes sense because there has to be something that is everything, that created everything, that governs everything. So then, you know, the unfortunate, you know, kind of like inconvenient kind of truth that we have to like come to terms with um, as a result of not, ha not our not having a free will is that, well, you know, God is not all good. And, and this is a, you know, difficult truth to accept. It, it's not foreign to the Bible, you know, in Isaiah. Isaiah, you know, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, God is quoted as saying, I create light, I create darkness, I create good, I create evil. So this isn't a foreign um, concept. In Hinduism, you've got um, Shiva, which I think is good, and um, some other god, I don't know. <laughs> There's like, Hindu gets this right, Hinduism gets this more right than, than Judeo-Christianity. But the idea is, so like, yeah, we, we come to terms with this. And interesting, so let me, let me get into actually a kind of like, a, so we've basically gotten into the, the three um, aspects of, of enlightenment. And, you know, we've done a lot of shows on the details, you know, like on the idea of oneness, you know, being at one with everyone and, you know, living in the present and, and you know, kind of like overcoming attachments, cravings, desires, you know, this idea of the, the Buddhism's Four Noble Truths. And um, so, you know, I was planning to go into this in, in more detail, but like there's one thing that I've been struggling with recently that, that maybe it's good to end on. Um, basically, all right, so like I was raised, you know, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. You know, I was Orthodox Jewish for a few years. I was raised actually Episcopalian. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, my, my basic worldview is you know, of, of, of God. And, and most of us, you know, I was raised believing that God is all good. You know, most of us, you know, that's how I think most of us see God, right? Um, so, all right, as a result of understanding nobody has a free will, that God controls everything, then the, 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 the unavoidable truth becomes, well, God can't be all good. If God is all powerful, you know, God is responsible for, for both the good and good. And with good, we're just basically... Um, defining goodness as that which creates pleasure or happiness or the most pleasure, most happiness. And so, so again, so God can't, you know, if God is all-powerful, if God has created the world, is the world, um, you know, is responsible for everything that happens, obviously God is responsible for both the good and the bad. And, you know, it could be like, you know, there could be like another domain of beings, you know, um, that might be described theologically as angels and demons and just like these spirits and which which is really you know it's not so far fetched to believe this cuz um you know as we know in physics you know this this reality that we interact with on a daily ba basis that we can measure that you know we can detect and all it comprises only 4% of what's out there you know the rest of it is dark matter dark energy they know it's out there exerts a gravitational force but that's pretty much all they know about it and so like you know they're so like basically relative to this good so it could be that there are these like good spirits angels and demons and stuff that you know but but even so like god would still you know have set in motion this chain of cause and effect because they wouldn't have any free will either you know as a matter of fact i mean what's what's, what's interesting is god doesn't have any free will anymore because like if god for example set this chain of cause and effect in motion and that concept somewhat transcends logic because if you go back eternally you never stop going back to a, an actual beginning but you know pragmatically speaking I guess you know if, if God knew for example what God and, and everything was going to be like today if God knew that a billion years ago because God is supposed to be omniscient and it makes kind of like sense if you are everything you know everything then God himself is, is locked into this cause and effect. You know, God can't do but what God knew a billion or 14 billion years ago that God was going to do. All right, so like, so then, so what my dilemma is like, so then there's God, you know, which, which comprises, you can't deny God's existence. God is everything. God controls everything. But then there's goodness and evil. And again, goodness is what creates pleasure and happiness and evil is what creates pain and, and, and unhappiness. And so you got to understand, we human beings 
are biologically designed, hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. That's who we are. You know, we can't, it's not our choice whether or not to do that, you know, be that way. Sometimes we may choose to undergo um, some pain because we predict, you know, the outcome will be better. For example, like getting through four years of college and a couple of other two years of grad school to be able to have a better life after that or, or undergoing a marathon, you know, 26 miles or whatever, to feel good about having done that or being a parent and just sacrificing one's needs for the needs of, of one's children. So, you know, we, we, we sometimes make sacrifices and invest in pain, but it's usually either to like to satisfy our conscience, you know, what we know is right, and, and as what, what we predict will uh, give us a better life because, you know, rightness is, is, is so tied with reward. Or, or it's an investment in great, greater pleasure in the future. But, um, but so the, the idea, so we have this goodness and, and evil, and we, you know, and naturally as hedonic creatures, we are about goodness. We're about pleasure. We, so like, all right, the dilemma here is that, here it is. So like, um, basically, at, you know, on and off throughout my years, uh, I've, I've prayed to God, okay, and praying to a great extent simply means, you know, talking to God just like you would to a person, thanking God for, for the good stuff, <laughs> and for the other stuff saying, hey, God, you know, well, it'd be a nice idea if you changed it, if you made things better. Um, so that was my perspective, but then I started to think about it, and like, let's say imagine God as... Um, your parents, right? And, and you're unfortunate. Well, you're f fortunate in that one of your parents is like a saint. I mean, the, the, the pe best person on the planet, right? <laughs> and, and, and the other parent is the worst person on the planet. I mean, you know, so, like, so you've got these two parents. And naturally, I mean, as, as hedonic, pleasure-seeking, goodness-seeking beings that we are, because we're also like, we're, we're not just hardwired to seek pleasure, we're also hardwired to seek goodness, because we define goodness as that which creates pleasure. So like, you know, from the, with this analogy, you know, like, if we have our, our choice, who are we going to relate to? If we relate to, to, to these parents as a couple, you know, both of them, well, all right, we may be lucky, and, and, and um, the better, the saintly parent is, is the, the one who hears us and, you know, you know basically relates to us. Or, um, but, but then, like, you know, when we're addressing both parents, the, 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 the truly horrific evil parent might just, like, jump in and just make things worse. So, so that's the problem that we seem to have with God. You know, sometimes when we address God, and God is both good and evil, and, and again, think about the most wonderful thing. There's a lot of good in this world. There's a, a, a great deal of good, but there is also like horrific evil, again, like what happens with, um, with animals, you know, that, that we're cruel to. So, all right, so from this perspective, you know, like, just like we wouldn't want to either like hang out with this, like you've got two parents, hang out with this, completely evil parent, we would just want to be with the, uh, with the good parent, um, you know, that, that applies to God. In other words, if God is the totality, you know, has a totality, but God is comprised of goodness and evil, um, if we relate to God, then, you know, we could catch God on a good day and he's, God's good to us. We catch God on a bad day. God's bad to us. So, like, you know, I've been exploring this, and, and you know, I don't have an answer. I, you know, earlier this morning I was thinking about it, and, like, um, it's the idea I've, I've begun to experiment with just relating to the good side of, of God, to, to goodness. In other words, like, I've started just talking or praying or relating to goodness, you know, not, you know, being a little hesitant, you know, I'll, I'll address God once in a while, but, you know, with some hesitation, because, you know, again, like, and, 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 you know, with the evil, I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with just not wanting to deal with evil at all, not wanting to address it, <laughs> you know, for, because you don't want to encourage it. You know, evil, you know, by definition is what creates pain and un, unhappiness. So certainly, like, in, in our, all our interactions, like, we don't, we don't, um, we don't try to, like, you know, make friends with people who are evil and, you know, we, we try to stay away from evil people and evil things and all. So, um, 
that's, that's the dilemma. Another way of describing the dilemma is kind of like seeing God as a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type character. If you know, remember the story, it's about this guy who, um, who during the day is this doctor, you know, Dr. Jekyll, who performs, you know, doctors are wonderful people, or, you know, probably the most saintly people on the planet, you know, considering all the good they do. So he's, he's really good during the day. Then at night, he turns it to Mr. Hyde, um, who is just like, I don't know what, I, I didn't read the book, but I, you know, kind of know about it. He just like started doing evil. So like, so God seems to be this like, this, this Jekyll Hyde character. Again, the, the, the question, do we just, um, might it be wiser to just relate to, to, to goodness, to, to pray to goodness, to worship goodness, and leave God and evil, you know, <laughs> On, I don't know. And again, it, it's an open question. I haven't figured it out. I'm not going to say what's wisest or not. But anyway, um, we're wrapping down. And I hope you've enjoyed this series, 21 episodes. Um, you can catch them all on YouTube. Um, and you can also catch my other two um, series. Uh, you know, again, 216 episodes on, on exploring the illusion of free will, why we don't have a free will, why it matters. And about 15 years ago, I did a... Um, a series on happiness called The Happiness Show, and all the episodes are, are on YouTube, 138 episodes. And so you can, you know, get just a better idea of the happiness aspect of this enlightenment. So, again, with enlightenment, you know, it, it's something that, um, it's not something we need to do, but it seems like both as a culture, as a global civilization, as, ad, as individuals, is something that we naturally aspire to. Becoming a better person, becoming better morally, better to oneself in the sense of becoming happier, and better to other people in the sense of helping other people become happier, and just again, gaining a better and better, more accurate understanding of reality, understanding that nothing is up to us understanding the you know the god is both good and evil all right well thanks for watching and i hope your enlightenment journeys are excellent thanks